a lot of people probably took off from work, and I'm happy you're all here, and we're going to set up a turntable and uh, show you how it's done. So my name is Michael Fremer. I'm a senior contributing editor at Stereophile Magazine and the editor of Analog Planet. And uh, I've been setting up turntables for more years than I, than I care to think about. So I think it's really important that everybody who has a turntable knows how to set it up himself and doesn't have to depend upon a dealer. Because the dealers are going to take only so much time to do this for you. They've got to be on a clock. They're, it's a money issue. Uh, if you do it yourself, you know you've done it correctly. You got it done, and you can have the satisfaction of knowing you set up your cartridge. And then, if God forbid anything happens to it, you can get another one and set it up yourself and not have to take the turntable to the dealer and start over again. So there's a lot of reasons why doing this yourself is a good idea. It's not all that difficult, believe it or not, once you know what you're doing. If you're not comfortable with this at first, get a $20 Grado cartridge and set it up yourself. And if worse comes to worse and you break it, you're out 20 bucks. You know, don't start with like a $1,000, $2,000 Kowetsu cartridge. It's not a good idea. Start with something inexpensive. Don't make it easy on yourself. So when I do this, and I do it a lot, the first thing I do is I make sure I'm in a good mood. You know, I don't have a fight with my wife. I'm not fighting with my wife. In my case, I don't watch Fox News, but it could be MSNBC, whatever your politics are. Don't watch any of that stuff, you know. Uh, be in a good mood. Don't do it on a day where you can't go to the hardware store and get screws if you drop them and they go behind a radiator. Try to do it out in the open uh, on a table where you're not bending too much and where there's good light. And really, don't do it in front of 100 people you don't know. It's a very, bu it's a very bizarre thing. But I have to do it. The other thing is, um, you know, be properly dressed. Don't be wearing a tie and a jacket. So I'm going to take this off and, and take off my tie. That's all. Don't worry. That's all that's coming off. So, um, I had a friend fly in from England to set up a turntable for the president of uh, the CEO of Atlantic Records, and he set up a very expensive cartridge in an SME turntable. And the first record that the owner went over to play, he got his alpaca sweater caught in the stylus and broke it right off. So, yeah, it was really sad. So try to, you know, try to be dressed correctly when you're doing this um, and be in the right mood. So we're going to set up a, a VPI. I guess this is a classic... Um, what is it? Classic one. And uh, I'm doing it with a unipivot arm because that way I can adjust all the different parameters and you can um, see everything get done. I want to make sure I have the right tool for this. Is my friend there who took the boxes out? Do you know where she is? Because I need, I need some other tools. I should have, um, but I can get started anyway. Uh, this isn't the right thread. So anyway, you'll have to just pardon my back because I'm going to be over here. There's just nothing I can do about this. And you'll be able to see it on the television. I'll try to um, stand in a way that you can see everything without me blocking it. So the first thing I wanted to say to you is if you, um, if you buy a turntable like this where it comes from the factory with the arm preset, you don't have to worry about what I'm going to just going to say right now, but let's say you go on, on AudioGon and you buy another brand of turntable where there's an arm, like a triplanar arm on a different kind of turntable. The first thing you really should do is make sure that whoever drilled that arm board uh, got the pivot to spindle distance correct. It's really critical to have that correct if you're going to use uh, a protractor to set the, the overhang, which is the distance the cartridge sits in the head shell. So, it's very easy to check this. You can get yourself uh, a plastic ruler. I use a metal one. Drill a hole in it. Um, you can either make something up like this, put it on here, and just measure the number of millimeters. You can go on vinylengine.com and look up virtually any tone arm that's been manufactured over the past 50 or 60 years and see what the pivot to spindle distance is and make sure it's correct. If it's wrong, everything you're going to be doing is going to be slightly wrong. And I'm not sure what you can do to remedy that once the hole's been drilled, except have it re-drilled somehow. If there's a separate arm board, you can do that. If it's a table like this, you're kind of stuck. So you, you might have to return the table to the person you bought it from. But assuming that that's all correct, that the pivot to spindle distance is set correct, the first thing you're going to do is install the cartridge. And you want to make sure that hopefully your cartridge will have a stylus guard. I, 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 well, I'll do the best I can. Um, Otherwise, it gets kind of dicey. So the first thing I like to do is just put one screw in instead of two so I have access to the, um, to the back of the cartridge. Another thing you want to make sure is that your, your platter is level. So get a little bubble level 
put it on the platter, and make sure it's level. And this just happens to be level, which is a good way to start. So I'm just going to take one of these screws, and I'm going to put it in there like that. This is not going to be exciting. You know, I'm, it's not like watching Gladiator or something, so you're just going to have to deal with the fact that I'm installing a cartridge in a turntable. I'm not you know, providing entertainment. Now, when I talk to people who've tried to do this and have not been successful, one of the big issues that comes up is that the pins on the back of the cartridge and the clips that come on the tone arm, you'd think after all these years of manufacturing this stuff that all the manufacturers of the turn, tone arms and the cartridges would get together and say, let's standardize the size of all of this stuff. But they haven't done that. So frequently what happens is you try to push this clip onto the pin and it doesn't go. And then you push and you push and you push till you break it. And then you've got to start with a soldering iron and people get very upset about that. So the first important thing you should know, the most, probably the best thing that you learn all this whole time is get a toothpick. And if you go to do this and the opening in the clip is too small, take the toothpick and put it in the hole and open it up a little bit. On the other hand, if you find that it's too loose, you really don't want it to be loose. And also, you get a good pair of pliers, needle nose pliers. Don't use your fingers to do this. If it's too loose, you're going to want to tighten it. And you're going to want to tighten it because there's a very small amount of electricity, a very tiny voltage that's going through this, and you want a tight fit. This one just happens to be perfect. But if it's too loose, again, don't take the pliers and crush the clip because you'll never get it open again. Put the pliers inside and then slowly squeeze it. And if you do that, you'll get this part of it correct, and you will not have a disaster on your hands. Now, the color code is pretty basic. It's white is the left hot, and you can remember the white hot, and red is the right hot, and that's obvious. Red is right. And then the red and the green goes together, and if you have to think about Christmas colors, whatever, whatever, you, whatever you have to use. Most cartridges do come with little colored washers on the back that, that correspond with the, um, with the colors of the wire, so it makes it easy. If not, it'll be written in very difficult to read um, lettering, and you'll just have to figure it out. Now, some people like to twist the pairs, the red and the green and the white and the blue, and they think it lowers the noise or they think it makes it look neater. If you want to do that, go ahead. I'm not going to do it for, for our purposes because I really have to keep moving here. So that's done. So now I'm going to put the second screw in. I once did this completely trashed on tequila. It was pretty funny. <laughs> well, I, you know, what had happened was I had, I had some people over, and we had a party. And when the party was over, I said, I've got to go down and listen to music. And I had forgotten that I had taken my turntable apart to review another turntable, and I had sent that one back. And so I didn't have a turntable. And you know, I was not going downstairs to listen to CDs. It was just not going to happen. <laughs> So I said, all right, I'm going to set up my turntable. And it was in pieces. And I got it all together, and I installed a, uh, a Lyra Titan I like this. And I set it up, and it, it sounded great that night. And I was wondering how it would be the next day. And it was, it was perfect. So I was very proud of myself. For, but I don't recommend doing that. Don't do that. Wait till the next day. OK, so now I've got both screws in now. and uh, I'm, off to a good start. So the next thing is, we have to, first thing we have to do is uh, check, check what the stylus force is. We, we don't want to um, be too heavy because we don't want to break the cantilever before we start with our setup. So I'm pretty good at measuring this with my fingers at this point. That's too heavy. So I'm just going to lighten the counterweight a little bit. So I think it's, this is going to track at two grams. So that seems pretty good to me. I'll just check it. Get a digital stylus pressure gauge like this is a one that uh, Music Direct sells. It's like $79. It's, it's a, a pretty good one. The other important thing to remember is that there are, there are different ways that an arm can be balanced. There's a negative balanced arm. There's a static balanced arm. And there's a, um, I forgot what the third one is. But anyway, one of them, uh, the higher up you measure it, the heavier it's going to be it's going to measure because it wants to get, it wants to, get to the bottom. It wants to settle onto the, onto the surface. 
There's another kind of arm, depending on how the, how the mass is distributed on the um, counterweight, where it's going to want to give you a negative measurement. So if you measure it up high, it's actually going to show a, ne a lower measurement than it would be on the surface. So it's very important to measure it as close as possible to the surface of where the record is. Now also, remove any kind of platter mat, especially the felt kind that come with the Rigas or the, or the projects, because they're cartridge killers. Do it as close as possible to the, to the platter surface. This one is a little bit tall, so it's going to be slightly off. But in the end, you're going to want to set the stylus pressure based upon listening within the, the range recommended by the cartridge manufacturer. Say what? A tool. Oh, I, yes, I needed, uh, I needed, there's a couple of Allen wrenches in the box. I should have taken them out, but I, I could use them. Oh, the box is right there. Great. If you could get that for me, that would be fantastic. Okay, so now I'm just going to check to see how close I came. And do this very carefully in case you're not good at estimating. You don't want to collapse the cantilever. So do it quickly and see where you're at. One eight. See, that's, that's when you're a pro. You can do this that way. Um, it's very sad when your things you're proud of in your life are getting the stylus pressure good by hand, but whatever. Okay. So my life is reduced to. Okay, so I've got that correct. Now we're going to set the overhang. So what is the overhang? What does that mean? When records are cut, the cutting stylus is cutting a straight line. So it's describing a straight line. Now there are tangential tracking, thank you, tone arms, theoretically, that do describe that same arc, but most of us are using pivoted arms. That means it's describing an arc across the surface of the record. So since the stylus is not going to maintain tangency to the groove across the surface, because it's an arc, there's going to be some distortion. There's going to be some distortion because it's not maintaining tangency. Fortunately, there are these guys, these mathematicians in the 1930s, uh, Lofgren, Bearwald, and a guy named Percy Wilson who worked for, um, I think, Hi-Fi News way, way back, who did a lot of mathematical uh, calculating and discovered that the first part that has to be done to minimize tracking distortion is there has to be an overhang. The overhang, and you've heard that term set, the overhang. The overhang is literally the amount by which the stylus overhangs the spindle. So if, if your turntable allows you to do that, you can see that the stylus is way beyond the pivot to spindle distance. The, the distance between the spindle and the stylus is called the overhang, and the distance from the pivot point to that stylus tip is called the effective length of the tone arm. The tone arm's length is shorter than that, but the distance of the overhang is the effective length. So the math has been done, and there's also an offset angle. You'll notice most uh, head shells are offset. There's an offset angle, and you can, you, you can see that it's offset. That's also part of their calculations, that there has to be an offset angle to minimize tracking error. So uh, there's Bearwald, there's Lofgren, there's Stevenson. There are all these different mathematical calculations. I prefer Lofgren A. I think it has the least amount of distortion. And the way Lofgren A has been calculated is there's uh, a little more distortion at the outside of the record. And the distortion goes down and down and down until it hits the first null point. The null point is the first place where the stylus is actually tangent to the groove, which is the way it was cut. Then the distortion increases and increases. Then it starts decreasing till it gets to the second null point where there is no distortion because it's tangent to the groove. And then the distortion starts going up. And the way it was done is, is that way is because that way your ear doesn't notice the distortion. It starts up at a certain height of distortion. You don't notice it because you have no, no thing to compare, compare it to. And then it slowly goes down, and there's no distortion. Then it slowly goes up, and then it goes down, and your ear doesn't notice these things. And you know, if your turntable is set up correctly, you don't really hear this. You should not hear any distortion. It should sound completely transparent as, as like a CD, but only much, much better if it's, if it's set up correctly. There are lots of gauges you can buy online, and, uh, and most of them will do a very, very good job. And this one is a universal one. So you see, you see, all those, um, see all those curves on there? Those curves are for different effective length tone arms. So you have to know the effective length of your tone arm. And this is a JMW, um, it's, it looks like it's a 10, 10.5. So it's 259 millimeters is the effective length. So I, I look for the, the curve that's 259 millimeters. And that's 
the one I'm going to use. So I put this on here. Now VPI gives you a gauge, actually, and I've got it here. This is their gauge. And what they say is, if you put this on here, put it on the spindle, and you get the stylus. right in that little point there, then you've got the overhang correct. But I like to use this gauge because I can really show you the arc, the actual arc that it's supposed to travel, and I, I think it's, it, for me it's, it's better. The next thing you want to do is disable your platter so it doesn't spin. You can use a wedge like this if it works. If it doesn't work, a piece of tape will be fine. Anything, but make sure the platter doesn't move. This part of the process is the most annoying and time consuming. So you want to take your time doing this and you don't want to make it approximate, you want to get it exactly correct. So the first thing I do is I go to the 259 mark and I put the stylus right on. Now this is the Pilates part of the thing because you can do a lot of bending and a lot of moving. I guess you can see it to some degree. Maybe I should turn. Well, for this part of it, I'm just going to leave it like that. I, there's just nothing we can do. It's, it's going to be what it is. You'll, you'll have to just trust me on this. So I'm going to go in there and get yourself a, a good five times loop and, uh, and a good light. So now I've, I've got it in the groove. And you're saying to yourself, well, what does that mean? That means nothing because the thing's just moving around. That's the starting point. So now I'm going to take it and I'm going to move it to the end of the arc and see where the stylus is and the stylus is way in front of the arc. So what does that mean? That means I have to back the cartridge up in the body, in the arm. How much? Well, we don't know. That's, the, that's where this gets frustrating. So I'm gonna back it up a certain amount, and now I'm gonna start again. And now obviously it's not gonna line up at the 259 arc anymore because I've moved it in the head shell, and I'm gonna start over again. Now I'm gonna do this a few times, and if I don't get it, I'm going to imagine I did because otherwise we'll be here all day. This could take all day. This could take a long time. So it's important to like do it, and then if you get a little frustrated, take a break, go outside, get some fresh air, and come back in and continue. So now I'm going to move it in and see where I'm at. Still off. I got to go back further. Well, there's really no way to protect the stylus at this, at this point. You just have to be very careful. I've never broken a cartridge like this. I've done you know, hundreds of these things. I've never broken a cartridge. Just make sure you're, you're focused on what you're doing. Don't do that. You know what I mean? Like, don't be, be in the middle of this and, someone, and interrupt yourself. Try to focus in on what you're doing. And don't ever get mad at this. You know, some people get mad and they think, -da. don't get that way because it's like, just imagine having brain surgery and the surgeon's having trouble doing something. You never want it to be going, get that thing right there. You want it to stay calm and collected and do it carefully. So you make believe this is brain surgery. It's not nearly as difficult, but as far as I'm concerned, this is equally important. Hey, Mike, this is Ross. Yes, Ross. You know, here's the deal. I'm mad just watching this because when I, uh, I'm over here to your far right, over here, I was kind of hiding, but... When I'm watching this, I just plug my CD player in, be the beautiful disc in, and I'm playing. I don't have to set this, with tangential angles and this is all true. this crap. This is absolutely true. And the thing about this, you should understand, this, this is never perfect. So if you want perfection, listen to Ross and get a CD player. <laughs> but, you know, but we all know that after five minutes of listening to it, you just, I'm going to find something else to do. I'll watch a movie. I'll go out and do some gardening, whatever. I just can't sit and listen to it. No, wait a minute. You heard my CD player one year, and you said it was better than a lot of your turntables. So. Yeah, but you were twisting my arm and you had oh, my head in okay. a grip. Okay, you know, I, just, I just wondered, I just wondered. Okay, so, yeah, Russ was the cameraman that uh, interrupted me about six times during, it was funny actually, because, you know, listen, you have to have fun doing this. This can't be, you can't be too serious about this. You have to have fun. But I mean, is this really worth it for the incremental one, sure. sound once quality? You're, once over, you're done, uh -huh. you, you're done for, but for I, a long time. But I agree, but I'd like to remain 50, not 60 when I finished. Yeah, you know what? I like to cook. I make my own pasta. I cook all my own food. And I could buy Mrs. Paul's fish sticks or I could go to the <laughs> seafood market and get some really good fish and you know, make it myself. And that's what I prefer to do. So 
uh, and I enjoy the process of cooking. And you know what? I actually enjoy doing this. I, you know, and I think most of you, when you start doing it, when you know what you're doing, you'll enjoy doing it because you're doing it yourself and you're setting, up, you're setting it up and you're getting all the parameters correct. And when you're done, you know you've done it. How's your back doing? My back for an old person is fantastic because I do Pilates and I do this a lot. So, so I'm going to do this just a little bit more. Uh, it's not going to be exactly correct because I'm not getting it exactly correct. It, I need more time. And again, take your time until you get it exactly correct. So I'm going to try one more time, and then I'm going to just imagine I got it correct. But don't you do that. You get it exactly correct. See, that's what I think you do on your sound quality. You imagine it's a lot better. No, 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 no. You know, the great part about this is, as, you know, 10 years ago, I, I could have been defensive about this, but now I know this vinyl thing has just gone crazy, and kids are buying turntables. They're not imagining things. They're, they, brought up, they got brought up on MP3s, and the first time they hear a turntable, it's like, doing. Wow, I gotta have one of those. And they're buying them, and they're buying them in amazing numbers. It's, it's a stunning thing. And they can get the songs free on the internet, and they can, you know, there's a lot of ways they can do this, but they're buying the records. They also realize that if it's an artist they like, they're helping to support the artist. And they like the fact that rather than downloading a million songs and having this gigantic collection of music they don't need, can't put any form and function to, they've got an album with 10 songs on it that the artist wants them to hear in that order. There's a certain connection, and they get that. And this is, us older people, we had this in the 50s and 60s. We know what that is. And, and that generation didn't get that until the last couple of years. And they're enjoying every minute of it. And it's not going to be a fad, and it's not going to be like a, a novelty or a fashion thing. It's, it's, you know, Keith Richards was on Jimmy Fallon a couple of years ago. And, and uh, Jimmy Fallon says, so Keith, for you, what is it? Is it, is it CDs? Is it vinyl? Is it 78s? Is it cassettes? Is it a track? What is it? And he said, Oh, uh, for me, it's vinyl. And the whole audience burst into applause. If he had said CDs, do you think the audience would have burst into applause? I don't think so. I don't think that would have happened. I would have burst into applause easily. Now, yeah, they wouldn't have heard you, though. OK. All right. So I'm going to say it's in, it's in the arc all the way across. And we're just going to imagine that it is. If it's in the arc all the way across, then the overhang has been correctly set. OK? So now we know the distance from the pivot to the stylus tip is geometrically correct. Now we have to set the zenith angle. So what's the zenith angle? So the cantilever can be angled this way and that way, even though the overhang is correct, there's still this angle. And this angle has to be exactly correct because we want the, the stylus to be tangential to the groove at the two null points. So this is the part that I really want to make sure that you can see correctly. So you see on this gauge, aside from the arc, it also has this straight line here. And if you look here, you'll see there are three sets of lines here and three sets of lines here. And uh, there are two sets of, of, in each arc here, there are two, actually two sets of, of, of arcs. One's bare walled and one's loft grid. Those are two different guys that did slightly different uh, calculations for the overhang. Uh, I use Lofgren. I think that's the lowest distortion one. That's the one I recommend using. But if you look here, you'll see these, these hash marks. And so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put the stylus on the center hash mark right on that line. And then we're going to adjust the zenith angle so the cantilever is, per is parallel to the hash marks on either side of where we're putting it down. Does everybody get what that, what that is about? And hopefully, we'll be able to get the camera in there so you'll see exactly what that looks like. Because that's really critical to getting this part of the process correct. So the two null points are 2 and 4. So the stylus is now in that straight line. And now I'm going to get it in the middle of the two hash marks. OK. And now I really want them to be able to see this. 
So I may, I'm probably going to have to, um, can we dim the lights a little bit quickly for a short period of time? Is that possible? Because I, I want everybody to see this, because I've, I've mentioned this sometimes at these seminars, and people think they understand it. And then when I say, well, why don't you come up and look? And then they look and they go, oh, I didn't realize that that's what you meant. So I, I want everybody to be able to see this. I'm not sure this is going to work. Let's see if I can turn this. OK, this, this may work. Now, how, how far in can you come? Can you come further in? That's it? A little brighter? I think the angle's not right. It would have to be, it would have to be further up. Well, I'll try to. I'll just go here. and You're not going to be able to see it, but if you were standing directly in front of here, the cantilever is here, and there, are, there is a hash mark here, and there's a hash mark here. And the goal is to have the cantilever parallel to the two hash marks. You may find that it's a little bit off like that, or a little bit off like that. And then you have to twist the cartridge in the head shell until it's perfectly parallel to the two hash marks. Does everybody, everybody get that? Now, of course, what might happen when you do twist it in the head shell? You may upset the overhang. So you have to go back and check that. And if you've gotten it off where it's supposed to be, you're going to be not very happy. Then you take a break. And then you, you go outside and smile. And you start over again. So I'm going to assume that uh, this is correct. I don't, in fact, it is correct. This happens to be correct. It's exactly where it belongs. I don't have to twist it. But if I did have to twist it, I would just slightly twist it, whichever way it has to go, and then I would measure the overhang again. And if it was off, I would get that correct, then I'd go back and t do it as many times as I needed to until the overhang was exactly correct and the zenith angle was exactly correct. I, I mean exactly, and, and you can get it that way, and it makes a big difference. Okay, so let's say it's exactly correct now. So the next thing we have to do is tighten down these two screws. I've got them set so that they don't so the cartridge can't slide too much. Um, but now I've got to be very, very careful. So I'm going to hold it steady, and I'm going to tighten one screw a little bit, then the other screw a little bit, until it's snug. Now, how tight do you want to make this? Uh, it should be snug, but don't go crazy. And use uh, an Allen key like this. Don't use one of those angled ones, because you'll get so much torque going that you'll probably overdo it. So tighten it down so it's very snug, but don't deform the cartridge or, or the head shell. So now we've really taken care of the worst part of the job, believe it or not. We've gotten the overhang and the zenith angle correct. The next thing we're going to do is we have to go back and, and check the stylus pressure because we've moved the cartridge in the head shell, and that's going to change the stylus pressure. Also, if you're setting up uh, an arm like this, which allows you to adjust the, the azimuth, it's going to be probably a little angled too much one way or the other. It's not going to be perpendicular. Try to adjust that before you start doing any of this. So you'll have to loosen however your arm adjusts azimuth. Make sure, make sure it's, it's fairly perpendicular. So now let's see what we got. So one last question, Mike. How, yep. how much money am I going to have to spend in tools to get my turntable set up? I think you could probably get an Allen screwdriver for a couple of dollars. I think you can get, you can get a uh, stylus pressure gauge for about $70, a good one. Um, an overhang gauge, you can get one. Well, this turntable, the turntable comes with one, which you can use, which is fine. Or you can buy one for a couple hundred dollars. So, you know, it's going to cost you a little bit of money. Okay, so $300, $350. How many uh, CDs could I buy with that? Good, re well recorded CDs. Good sounding ones? Yes. None. You're such a smart butt. <laughs> I knew you'd come back. Ones you that. can listen to in the car. Yeah, a whole lot you can listen to in the car. Uh, uh, ones that you can listen to while you're cooking or, uh -huh. or doing gardening. Probably a bunch, but ones where you're going to sit down and turn the lights out and go, wow, there's an orchestra right there. None. No. I noticed when I shook your hand this morning, there was a lot of wax in your ear, so I don't believe that. 
Okay, well, you know, I always say about this hobby, whatever it is you like, and I know you can go into these rooms and some people like speakers that sound like that. Fine, some people like speakers that sound like that. And I, there's all different tastes in all of this. So if you don't like records and you like CDs, then fine. If you like high resolution downloads, whatever you like, you can find it here. It's, it's, it reminds me of a joke. Amor Bose and uh, Paul Klipsch meet in heaven and only you will enjoy this joke. So, so Amor Bose, so Paul Klipsch goes, hey Amor, how are you? And Paul Klipsch goes, and Amar goes, fine, how are you, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> Try that joke in front of people who aren't audiophiles, and they go, what? What do you? <laughs> okay, so we're looking for about two grams, is what we're looking for here. The tracking force suggested by DynaVector is 1.78 to 2.2, so we're going to set it right in the middle. It's a little bit light now. Also, when you do this, make sure that you're starting close to where it belongs because don't forget the cantilever is a spring and the further down you push it, the more forward the stylus tip is gonna go. So you don't wanna be doing this setup with it like this and then when you set it to the tra right tracking force, it's out of alignment. So make sure it's pretty close all along when you're doing this. So I've gotta make this a little heavier. Mike, you're doing an excellent job, so I'm gonna go take some pictures. Feel free, I'll, I'll hold in my gut. And the next thing we're going to set is the anti-skating. Also, when you, set, when you measure tracking force, make sure you don't have the uh, cueing lever up because it won't change otherwise. <laughs> and be prepared to make mistakes. You know, I've been doing this forever and, you know, mistakes happen. You have to just go back and check your work. And if you're not comfortable doing what I'm doing, use the cueing lever. I I'm comfortable enough now that I can, plus it's not my cartridge, so I really don't care. And <laughs> no. I mean, I rebuilt a car engine, so this is nothing. This becomes very simple. Okay, so now I'm at two, that's where I wanna be. Okay, so, so now I've got, the, I've got the overhang correct, I've got the zenith angle correct, I've got the tracking force correct, and the next thing I'm gonna do is tie my shoelace or I'm gonna trip and kill myself. So uh, the next thing we're gonna do is set the anti-skating. So, so what is skating? Well, skating has to do with the offset angle of the head shell. It's not centrifugal force, which sometimes you'll see online. There's friction in the groove. So when you play a record, uh, there's a drag in the groove. And the amount of friction in the groove is dependent upon how heavily modulated the groove is, the formulation of the vinyl, the um, where on the, across the surface of the record you measure it. So that's going to affect how much friction is in the groove. Now, if so, where where is that force being applied? Well, it's the cantilever is in the, in the record, and the the drag is going to be directly behind the cantilever. If there was no offset angle, then the drag would be right in line with the pivot point. But because there's an offset angle, the drag is actually going in this direction, which is well away from where the pivot point is. So th it's that distance between the actual pivot point and the frictional line behind the cantilever that causes the arm to pull in towards the center of the record. So if you don't compensate for that, then the stylus is gonna ride the inner groove the whole way in. So you really have to try to compensate for it by applying some anti-skating force to kind of get the stylus in the middle of the groove. Can you get it perfectly? No, there's no way to get it perfect, but you can certainly make it better than it would be if you just let it ride the inner groove all the way in. So different manufacturers have different ways of applying anti-skating. There was a time when VPI, when Harry Weisfeld and VPI said he didn't believe in skating. Well, skating is a real force. That's just, just the way it is. It's a, it's a real thing and it has to be compensated for. So uh, originally he said, well, you twist this wire around and you'll, you'll be applying a counter force. And that's true, but this is a unit pivot R. You're also going to be affecting the azimuth. So it's not a good idea to do that. So he's eventually come around and he now uses a piece of monofilament and a lever arm which is what most manufacturers use. Sometimes there's, there's a weight 
and a little loop and it hangs over and sometimes there's a magnetic system that applies the anti-skating. Whichever one your manufacturer uses, they're going to recommend uh, the amount of anti-skating to apply depending upon how heavy the tracking force is. So um, I'm not suggesting you get this little gauge that I use. I just use it because it lets me know how accurately the manufacturer has calculated his anti-skating gauge, and I'll show you how that works in a second. It's, it's the one fun part of this whole thing, because I could screw everything up and ruin the cartridge. But, so I'm going to apply the monofilament. Can you, can you see? Oh, good. That's good. So you see this lever here? You see the three um, O-rings at the end of the lever? So you can see that that weight is going to pull the arm back. See that? Okay, so now I use this gauge because this gauge has been designed to allow me to see exactly how much anti-skating force is actually being applied. I once had this gauge with me on an airplane and uh, I had to get through customs in Amsterdam. And if you fly to Europe, you go through two sets of uh, security. You go through one when you first get to the airport and then they have a second one at the gate. So I'm going through the, the second security and I had this whole thing broken down in a, in a, in a plastic bag. And the woman said, what is that? And she pulls it out. And how am I going to start to explain her what this thing is? So I said, ah, oh, I'm in Amsterdam. This is for skating. She goes, oh, OK. And I was able to go. All right, so now there are marks on this lower tube. And this gauge essentially a version of this gauge was in, invented by some people at, I think, Ortofon or, or one of the cartridge manufacturers. And what I'm looking for is um, 10 deviations from the plumb bob. And you can see plumb bob is here, and that string is there. And there's five, six, seven, there's nine deviations. That's pretty close. Again, this is, this is an approximation. You'll see if I remove. You see what happens? It lines up. I hope you can see all this stuff. Yeah, you can see that. It lines up pretty closely. Actually, from where I'm standing, it's, it's almost perfect. And then when I apply the anti-skating, see what happens? I would actually put a little bit more. I would either add another O-ring or I would move these out a little bit. Let's see what we get. Because I, I want 10 deviations. So it's still about eight. But anyway, you don't need to worry about this. When I review an arm, I, I try to see how accurate it is. I found that project arms are extremely accurate. They, there's like little notches on a, on a pipe that comes out the back. And they say, if you're tracking at two grams, put it on the second notch. If you're tracking at one gram, put it on the first notch. I've used this gauge, and I, I found that their um, settings are extremely accurate. Same with Riga. They have little notches on their magnetic system. Most of the manufacturers are, are pretty accurate. Uh, I always say a little less anti-skating is better than a little more, but definitely apply some. And again, all of these are compromises and none of them are perfect. If you start listening and you hear, start hearing inner groove distortion on one channel and it's the left channel, then you probably don't have enough anti-skating and you want to apply a little bit more and, and vice versa. So you, you know, listen to the channels and you can pick which, which one is not getting enough pressure on it. Um, now the next thing we're going to set is the vertical tracking angle. And um, so what is the, what is, why is that important? Well, when records are cut, the cutter head is offset from directly above the, the line that goes across the record that's being cut. So it's cutting in a sickle-like motion. It's cutting like that. So the vertical modulations in the groove are angled like that. So you want to try to set your cartridge up so that it's going to reproduce those same angles that are engraved in the, in the groove. And so what is the right angle for that? Well, it's got to be over 90 degrees, because when you cut a record, you're, you're cutting a slice in the lacquer, and that slice has to be vacuumed out, otherwise it can catch fire. So, it's, so the cutting stylus has to be over 90 degrees so that a little vacuum on the other side can remove it. So there was research done by uh, guys that used to work at disc washer, and they went all around the country, all around America, back during the heyday of vinyl. And they measured the cutting stylus rake angle of about 50 different um, cutting systems that were in, in use in America in the 70s and 80s. 
and 91 to 92 degrees is the correct stylus rake angle. Now the vertical tracking angle, I'm going to show you this. This is, the vertical tracking angle is a line drawn between the tip of the stylus, it's, it's the red line over here, to, it's not the cantilever, it's inside, it's where, it's inside the cartridge is, is what the, the vertical tracking angle is, from inside the cartridge to the stylus tip. The stylus rake angle is this yellow angle right here. So it's this angle and, and the record surface. And all the measurements that have been done show that 92, approximately 92 degrees is the best place to set the stylus rake angle, which is more important than the vertical tracking angle. If you set it at 92 degrees, uh, you know, you can sit there and fiddle with it and listen and do all this listening, but if you can get it exactly at 92 degrees, you're, you're done, essentially, for most of the records in your collection. Um, early, in the early days of stereo, there were some cutter heads that did cut directly above, um, but most of them are offset by a couple of degrees. There are some people that think that they want to change it with every thickness of record because it's going to be different and they're hearing a difference. I really don't believe that they're hearing a difference in stylus rake angle because to change the angle by one degree, you have to have a difference in thickness of almost four millimeters, and that's much thicker than the difference between a 120 gram record and a 180 gram record. So what I do is, I mean, I'm in this, like Ross says, I'm in it to play tunes. I'm not in this to fiddle with this once it's done. I set my stylus rake angle at 92 degrees and I leave it there. Now how do I set it at 92 degrees? Well, I use a digital microscope to get these pictures. And a digital microscope will set you back about $250. I'm not suggesting that if you buy a $200 cartridge, you should invest $250 in a digital microscope. But I am saying, if you've bought a cartridge that costs $5,000, the first thing is, you want to look at that cartridge under a microscope to see whether it's been manufactured correctly. Because a lot of cartridges are not manufactured correctly. And when the manufacturer tells you, make the arm parallel to the record surface and you're done, well, the reality is that's ridiculous. Because if you look under the microscope, at a variety of cartridges, you'll find that the stylus, well, when they insert the stylus into this, into this uh, cantilever, the angles are all over the place. Some are, some are going to be correctly manufactured like this. Some are going to be off at an angle where it's impossible to get 92 degrees. Some are going to be at 87 degrees. And uh, when you get a cartridge like that, you want to send it back to the manufacturer or to the dealer and say, look, I spent $5,000 on a cartridge. I want one that, where, the, where the stylus has been inserted into the cantilever at an angle that at least I can hope to get 92 degrees. So if for your own quality control, it's worth getting one of these microscopes. Um, so the way it works is it looks like this. It's kind of a pain in the ass, but, but it's worth doing. You got to be very careful. I use a CD. It's one of the great uses of a CD is to put the record down on the CD and then you can move the CD back and forth till you get it in focus. And when you get it in focus, you end up with something like this. And this ridge right here, it's hard doing this, this that ridge is the, is the actual ridge that's going to contact the, the grooves and that's what's going to read the vertical modulation and that is the ridge that has to be at 92 degrees. So how do you set it for 92 degrees? Well, if you, if you do buy the microscope, it does come with software that lets you draw the lines, and it will measure the angle for you. And there's some subjectivity to this, too. When you try doing it, you'll see you can, depending on when you draw the line that goes uh, along the surface of the record, you can vary it by a couple of degrees. But you can come very, very close this way. And then you, you could listen and see, maybe change it a little bit and get it exactly where it, where it belongs. If you have a, uh, a replicant stylus or an Ortofon um, or a Geiger stylus, it's actually, if you, if you spend a lot of money in a turntable and you've spent $5,000 on a cartridge, this is something the dealer's not going to do. They're just not going to do that. They just don't have the time to do this. But if you get the microscope and get it set up correctly, and it's kind of fiddly at first because the stylus will fall off the edge of the, uh, of the platter, and then you'll start over again, and then you won't get it in focus, and then you'll be look you won't even find the stylus for a while because, it just, because the magnification is so extreme. But once you get, get the hang of this, you'll be able to lock it in and see exactly what you're doing and get it correct and know it's correct. So then, then you're, we're almost done, actually. So the next thing you're going to want to do is set your azimuth. So yeah.
Right. You're going to raise the back. But, but if, if the cartridge is properly manufactured, it should be close to 90 degrees when, it's parallel, when the arm is parallel to the record surface. Then you're going to move it up 8 millimeters and you, uh, for a 9-inch arm, and you'll get 92 degrees. The problem is if the cartridge is not manufactured correctly, and it is 87 degrees when it's parallel to the record surface, you're going to have to raise it so it's, it's, a, it's going to be grotesque, assuming you can even get it high enough. What's that? You mean shimming the? You can do that too. But really, if you're spending that kind of money on a cartridge, you shouldn't have to do that. If you buy an inexpensive cartridge and you find that, then yeah, then use a, use a shim. I had a guy come over with an EMT uh, turntable that he bought from uh, South America. And he bought an EMT cartridge to go in it. And he set it up with the arm parallel. And, and he was new at this whole subject. But he, once he gets into things, he gets in crazy. And he said, it's sibilant and it's spitting. I said, why don't you bring it up? Bring it up to me, because this is a turntable I've never seen, one of these old EMTs. I want to see it. So he brought it up, and he looked under the microscope. And the EMT was, the cartridge was way, way off. I had to raise the arm way up to get it correct. He goes, that's ugly. I said, OK, it's ugly. Let, let's listen to it. And all the sibilance was gone, and it sounded perfect. I said, so what do you want? Do you want it to look good, or do you want it to sound good? And he got it home and he called me and said, this is unbelievable. All the records I played that were sibilant and spitty and bright sound perfect now. So getting this correct is a really important thing to do. OK, so the last thing you have to do to set this thing up correctly is get the azimuth correct. Now, some arms don't let you set, like a, a Rigo won't let you set azimuth. A, um, a SME will not let you set azimuth, and that, that's too bad. But the azimuth has to do with the perpendicularity of the cantilever and the stylus in the groove. The grooves are at a 45 to 45 degree angle, and they're each modulated. So when the stylus is sitting in the groove, it's reading one channel, it's reading the other channel. Theoretically, if everything's manufactured correctly, and you set the cantilever perpendicular to the surface of the record, you will have minimum crosstalk and maximum separation. Unfortunately, in the real world, it doesn't work that way because when the stylus is inserted into the cantilever, the odds of it being perfectly perpendicular in, or parallel to the, in the same line as the cantilever is not very good. It's going to be on an angle like that or an angle like that, slightly off. And then the cantilever is stuck in the motor. And the motor has two coils at 45 degree angles. And they are stuck inside the body of the cartridge. What are the odds that that is perfect? Very slim to none. So if you do it by eye, by putting a mirror on the, the plat platter and setting this angle so that the cantilever is perpendicular to the record surface, the odds of getting this azimuth set correctly is not very great. So there are different ways you can do this correctly. What you're trying to do, again, is minimize the crosstalk. So whatever's supposed to be in the left channel doesn't show up in the right channel, and whatever's in the right channel doesn't show up in the left channel. That's the goal. So how do you do that? The, e the most primitive way of doing it is to get a digital voltmeter and get a test record that's got a 1K tone only on the left channel and a 1K tone only on the right channel. And uh, Acoustic Sounds makes one called the Ultimate Test Record. That's got a very good uh, set of those tones. And what you do is you take, get a digital voltmeter, they're not expensive, and get some earplugs, because this gets loud. And uh, you need to get a decibel, a voltage to decibel voltage chart. And um, I've got one on my DVD, uh, on this DVD, on the PDF file in there, there is that chart, and you can print it out. You can probably find one online, and it will convert voltages to, to decibel voltages. So what you do is you put your digital voltmeter into the uh, terminals of the left channel of your amplifier and turn the volume up while you're playing the 1K test tone on the left channel till you read about 4 volts. And then quickly, before, this, before that test track ends, go to the right channel and you'll measure a very small voltage. Because, and that's the crosstalk. There should be nothing there, but there's always going to be some crosstalk. And write that down. Then play the test tone that modulates the right channel. And since you've already got the, the two meters, the, the two probes in there already, just measure, and it should measure close to four volts or three. It's going to be slightly different. Measure that. And before that channel ends, go in and go to the other channel and measure the crosstalk. It'll be a very small voltage. Go to the chart and convert the four volts to 
decibels, and it'll be something like 35 or 40 decibels, and then convert the small number, and it'll be something like 15 decibels. Subtract the large from the small, and you have the separation, the cross, the separation on the left channel. Do the same with the right channel, and you'll have two sets of, of numbers, and they'll be decibels. And most cartridges are good to about 28 to 32 uh, dB of separation. So if you're close to that, and they're within 2 dB of each other, you're done. The odds of that being true the first time you try it are not that great. So you're going to have to do this test about five or eight times. And the best way to do it is start with the arm purposely two degrees over to the right side and measure it, and then one degree, then perpendicular, then one degree, and then one degree. And then look at all the measurements and see which one seems to show the least amount of deviation between the two channels and the best separation between the channels. And then you're done. And when you do that, that makes a huge difference. That is one of the biggest differences that you'll hear in this whole thing. The sound stage will widen to as wide as it can possibly be, and it will even out. The center image will be perfectly focused because you've, you've balanced the two channels, so you've maximized separation and minimized the, the crosstalk and equalized the crosstalk. So the amount of crosstalk is equal between the channels within two decibels. So that's the hardest way to do it. You can also do it with the phosgometer. Anybody know the phosgometer? It's a device. It's, that's an approximation. It's not really as good as this, but it's a little bit easier. You can also get a, the Fikert. Dr. Fikert makes some software that lets you do this. And you have a, uh, he's got a little bubble level you put on top of your head shell and turn it till it's two degrees, take, it, take the bubble level off, measure it with the software, measure it, and then look at the results and pick the one that looks the best and then reset it to that. You can also use a digital oscilloscope. There's a way to put the probes on the output of a, of a phono preamp and play the test record and measure the voltage coming out of each of the channels. It's, that's the easiest way to do it if you can spend the money for a digital voltmeter. And again, Ross would say, well, how much have you spent for the digital voltmeter? Yeah, it's another $300 for digital voltmeter. But if you've got friends and you're in an audiophile society, you can all split the cost of it and figure out how to use it. And that way, when you're done with that and done with all of this, you've set everything using measurements. You've not used your ear. The only thing you want to use your ear for at the end is to set the stylus pressure to where you like it within the, what the manufacturer's range recommends. And then you're done. I mean, I, got, I went to Poland, I went to a hi-fi show, and a guy flew me in. He said, well, I'll pay for you to come in to do the, do the show, but you have to go to my house and set up my cartridge. And I said, okay, I mean, it was an adventure, right? So, I didn't know he lived three, mi three, three hours away from where the show was in Warsaw. So I get off the plane and I'm like, Phew. and we drive for three hours to his house and I had all my stuff with me. And so I, he had an Ornithon A90, which is a great cartridge, but it's got that very serious replicant stylus. And if you don't get the stylus rake angle in that correct, it's bad. So I went in there, he had set it up. I went in there and I used all my test equipment. I didn't have to listen to anything. And when I was done measuring, I said, I'm confident that when you play the first record that you're going to play, it's never sounded this good because it was way off from where it should have been. And we played the first record and it was like, wow, it's never sounded like that. So I know that doing it this way really works. So I believe in the measurement methodology. The problem is you can't be sure that the scale is going to be correct. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Of that. I, I did a turntable setup seminar in, in Norway. And I'm not going to mention the brand of the arm, but um, they drilled the hole. And um, I went through the whole bit with the audience and I said, look, make sure that it's been drilled correctly. You, you know, use a, uh, get a little a ruler and measure it. I measured it. It was off. This was off by like four and a half millimeters. And I said, if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have gotten the right setup because it was off. So after the seminar was over, and I couldn't actually move the cartridge in the head shell to, to get it correct. So then after the seminar was over, I went downstairs, and this was a German importer, and I said, this is off by four millimeters. He goes, no, that is impossible. No, I said it. Well, you know, I, uh, the, the manufacturer of the Tonom uh, emailed me uh, the measurements, the jig, and I, I cut the onboard using that, and maybe it didn't print out correctly, but tomorrow I will have the real jig. So the next day, he got the real jig, and he recut it, and I went up, and he stood there, he stood next to me, and I said, so yesterday, here's what happened, but today we used the real jig, so I went to measure. It was still off by four millimeters, because the manufacturer of that tone arm, his jig was wrong. I mean, that's crazy. And then when I wrote about it, he called me and said, you're making trouble for me. I said, I'm not making trouble for you, I'm trying to help you, and help, you know, he actually had it wrong. So 
if you use one of those, uh, I, I can't vouch for whether your printer can print it out in the right scale. I really think it's worth getting a decent, you know, if you buy a tone arm like this, it's gonna come with this gauge. And, uh, you know, I've correlated this with that, and, and it, it works. The only thing is I'd rather have two, make sure both null points are correct. I find a one point measurement is a, it's a little bit iffy in my world, but yeah, I, I don't think I'd want to print it out. And then it's paper, and then the paper has to be flat, and then if there's a little angle in the paper, it's not gonna be right. And it really makes, the, the tiny little differences in this overhang makes a huge difference in what you hear. The problem is this is, this is a guy named Wally that makes these, and he's, he, um, he's not reliable. And so, yeah. I, you, know, he, you could send him money and never get one, or maybe you will. But there's a guy named Mint, Mint in Hong Kong, Mint, M-I-N-T, plus it's mentholated and it clears, clears your throat. And his, his, are, his are the same basic thing. It's, it's cut on a laser and it's reflective, and his are very, very good. Mint. Where's that, mic where's that microphone? Because I want everybody to hear the questions, otherwise I think the microphone's right here. Okay. Um, to your left. So let's pass it around. Um, I, a lot of us have DA converters, and we can see a lot of uh, uh, the results for the left or right channel, summed on the oscilloscope uh, on your computer and so forth. Um, it, adjusting the asthma is very important, and uh, I was wondering if there is a way that when they're exactly summed that it's right at 45 degrees in that line. You mean line. If, you, if you put it in mono and, and, you, and, and look to try to make sure there's no, no. That just that doesn't work, you know, because well, all you're doing there is equalizing the electrical output of the cartridge. Okay. And then you're nulling it out. So you're nulling right. out the electrical output, but that's not the same as, as maximizing crosstalk. Sometimes the two can be the same, but the odds of that are not great because of all the variables that I mentioned of where, where the coils are sitting, whether they're perpendicular. There's is, a test record that tells you to do that, and it's absolutely a, wrong. Is there a way of using a setup like that to do kind of electronically what you're doing, uh, well, more mechanically, I mean, so visually, so you can see it on your computer and you can actually... Well, you know, I'm sure there are oscilloscope programs that mm -hmm. you can download, because this is not that difficult to do. It's, okay. it, you know, it's, it's a basic oscilloscope function. So what you have to do is um, take the output of a, of a known good phono preamp. I wouldn't use a tubed one that might have differences in, in output. You know, uh, it could be inexpensive, but if the output is the same on both channels, take the output and put it on probes and uh, play the left channel, and you want to take about, about 16 samples during, while it's playing, and then measure the voltages, and it'll give you two sets of voltages. One will be the channel that's modulated, and one the channel that's not modulated. And then play the next track, and then you have your numbers, and then you want to plug them into the decibel to voltage chart, and see what you get, and then work from there. Well, last question is, would it be most important to minimize the opposite channel, or to maximize the channel you're looking for, if you well, had? You want to, what you want to do is try to maximize the separation, minimize the crosstalk on both channels, mm -hmm. but have, have the amount of crosstalk be pretty close between the channels, within 2 dB if possible. <laughs> Matching them. So it's, it, it is kind of, it's, it's, it's an either or kind of thing. You can end up with 36 dB of separation on one channel and 21 on the other channel. Uh, you wouldn't want that. You'd rather, I'd rather have 28, 26 dB and 27 dB. Okay. I'd rather have the two mm -hmm. channels as close as possible and the separation within, within a reasonable range than have a gross uh, difference between the two. Well, I, wish I, could, you know, I wish I could come to these seminars and bring in a oscilloscope and show you all of these actual things, but it, it becomes, it just, it's not possible. But anybody who knows how to use an oscilloscope could probably show you how to, how to use it to do that. Oh, we have two micro. We've got stereo. Let's. Okay. <laughs> Would you ever set up the uh, the overhang on top of a record instead of just uh, on the platter itself? Um, so, because wouldn't that raise or lower the VTA a little bit? Well, it shouldn't really change that distance. It really shouldn't change the distance. Not not that much. Not to not to a degree. I, you know, I'd worry about. I would. I wouldn't worry about that. Okay. You know, don't, I wouldn't do it on a thick mat, and I wouldn't do it. If you want to do it on A record, that's a normal record. But don't forget, don't forget the stylus is going to be further down than the surface of the record anyway. So I just, I just because don't forget, you, you're going to use a gauge to measure it. That's going to give it a little lift. So yeah, just that little bit. And that's going to be pretty much where it belongs. 
What do you think of the Hi-Fi News test record for setting uh, anti-skate? Th that's the worst. That, that record's got two bad things on it. It's got that. You know, it's a, well, my, my cartridge can't, can't track that last inner groove there, you know, which is modulated at the atomic bomb level. Yeah, none, well, <laughs> none, yeah. of, none of them can. <laughs> like I said, you know, a skating is a function of the groove modulation. That's what causes some of the friction. Well, the amount of modulation of that groove is way in excess of anything you will ever encounter in the real world, so why would they even give you that? More neurotic audiophiles email me and say, my cartridge wouldn't track that inner groove. You know, all right, so? So big deal. Don't worry about it. You know, there's another really good test record. If you can ever find a used copy of the, uh, the Telarc OmniDisc, uh, it's, it's a really good, there's one really great test on there for anti-skating. They have it set right at the middle point of the record, which is a good place to have it, and they modulate both grooves, increasing modulation, and then they have a pilot tone that you can actually hear, and one channel is going to break up before the other, and you'll hear boo, and you hear buzzing on one channel or the other. So if the left channel starts buzzing first, it means that there's, and I'm a little math lexus, so I've got to think this through. So if the, if the left channel is buzzing first, that means there's too much anti-skating because it means the left channel is breaking up first. If the right channel is buzzing, it means there's too little anti-skating because the, group, the inner groove is being ridden and the, and the right channel isn't, get, isn't getting enough of the, of the stylus. That's a really good test. And then you set it so that the buzzing starts equally on both channels and then you've got it set correctly, although it's not correct. I thought that was correct for years until someone reminded me that that level of modulation where, where both channels break up is well in excess of what a normally modulated groove would be. So what you do is get it, get it set for that level and then back it off a little bit and that's the right level. Who's yeah. got the other? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a, a rake, a P25 table, and I've never tried to change the, uh, the rake angle on it because I have to do this with uh, the shims, essentially, that are under, underneath, the, right. underneath the tone arm axle axis. Well, How tedious a process is this, and is it something that you can, the other aspect of it is that since you can't hear the difference on the fly, well, it's, I don't trust my ears. There's a couple of variables there. First, it depends on what the stylus profile is of your cartridge. Uh -huh. If it's an elliptical stylus, it's not, this is not going to be as critical. I should have mentioned that before. It's the styli that have the, ri the, the, the extreme ridges that make the most difference. Like a round stylus makes no difference at all because it's round. It's, right. It's, it doesn't matter what angle it catches it at. If it's, if it's an elliptical stylus, it's slightly more critical. If it's a fine line or a shibata, it really is important. So when, when people say, what cartridge should I get? I want to like, upgrade to a, um, an Ortofon 2M Black, which has a Shibata stylus, and I've got a Riga arm. I will tell people, only do that if you are prepared to, to shim it and look carefully at the, at the stylus rake angle. Now, if you have one of the uh, older Rigas with the, with the tubular uh, insert, then you have to take the arm out right. and you know, put the shim in there or, or get one of those things that have threads where you can actually th thread it up and down. If you have one of the newer Rigas with a three-point mount, um, or Acoustic Signature, another turntable manufacturer, makes these really cool shims that only force you to unscrew the three screws and then you put it underneath. And, and that makes it really easy. So, and you know, you could <coughs> experiment with it. You'll hear it. I mean, I guarantee you, if you go in a room that has this kind of arm and have them push it all the way up and push it all the way down, you'll hear it really easily. If you have an exact stylus in your Riga, it's not going to make that much of a difference. Of course, Roy Gandhi doesn't think any of this makes a difference. Roy Gandhi doesn't think you should clean your records. I mean, you know, I think these guys are crazy. I went to Roy Gandhi's house once. I went use record shopping, and I was, went to visit him, and I said, let's test out your theory. Here's, here's a dirty record. Let's put it on one of your turntables. We did. By the middle of the record, there was so much dust and static that the arm lifted up off the record and just floated there. I said, Roy, don't tell people to not clean their records. I mean, it's, it's crazy. What kind of turntable system do you have at home? What do I have? I've got a Continuum Caliber, which um, costs, well, when I bought it, I, I reviewed the first one that came into the country. They were hoping to sell it for $90,000. So I get, an, I get a discount. So, and mine was a, was, was a really, it was a mess. It, it was plated with a chromium. It didn't look that good, and I got, a, I got a nice price. It still cost me as much as my car. But it was the best thing I ever heard in my life. And my wife came downstairs and I said, let me play, you. what do you like, Bonnie Raitt? She goes, oh my God, this is better than sex. And then I said, where does that leave me? But whatever. But, <laughs> but that's what she said. 
and, and I, I don't regret buying that ever. However, I can tell you that uh, the VPI Classic Direct Drive Turntable, which is it's 30, it's so close that it's upsetting to me. It uses the same motor, and it uses this, the printed arm technology. That's an amazing, it's, that turntable is going to do damage to this whole business, to other people making turntables at that price point. It's that good. And I don't, I don't normally talk like that, but it is, it's fantastic. So, and I bring CDRs that I make. And this is, a, this, if Russ was here, he would say, if you make a CDR from record and it sounds great, how can that be if it's a CD? But whatever it is, you play CDRs made from that turntable, people can hear it. But even so, if you get a, a, an inexpensive turntable and set it up correctly, it's going to sound great. It will. We should, let's get the um, microphone over there. I, I, you know, I, when I sit at the, in these seminars and people are in the front and they're asking a question and people in the back can't hear it, it's, just, it's very frustrating. Yeah, um, Michael, once you get it set up and you're ready to listen, how long do you think is a reasonable amount of time till the cartridge warms up and starts to bloom and sound great? You know, there's two points that I, I wanted to make. One, one is that point. The other point is if you get a new cartridge and you set it up and get the stylus rake angle correct, after about 50 or 60 hours, the, the, um, the suspension material is going to settle. And people have taken the time to measure that amount, and it settles by about one degree. So after about 40 or 50 hours of playing, you're going to want to raise the back of the arm about four millimeters for a nine inch arm to, to increase the angle by one degree again, because it's going to go down by about one degree. I find when I play records, it takes about the third or fourth record, it's singing. Thank you. The first so record, still not bad. I think four sides is yeah. what it takes. And then it's really getting, and, and then, it's really great. Right. Yeah. I was wondering uh, what uh, microscope do you use, and also what do you think about the old-fashioned uh, Sure uh, stylus pressure gauge, the little balance one? Yeah, the teeter totter. Okay, well that's interesting. Well, first of all, I use the AMT three thirteen. It's called. You get it on Amazon for two hundred and fifty dollars, and you got to get a decent stand for it and hold it in place so you can. The problem with that, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, there are three different kind of balances of an arm depending upon whether the center of gravity is in line with the bearing, above the bearing, or below the bearing. And most arms are, um, and I keep forgetting, I keep mixing the three up, but most arms are more, more like a laboratory balance, which wants to get to its resting point. Therefore, if you measure it higher up, you're going to get a, you're gonna get a, a lower measure, a higher measurement, because it's going to want to go down, than it would be at the surface of the record. So you'll get a wrong measurement. So the problem with the teeter-totter is it's measuring it that high up. I mean, I could, I could probably do it right here by hand since it's not my cartridge and I don't care. And uh, I've never broken a cartridge doing this. But I'm going I'm to try this at the surface of... And this one is actually a, li a little high. So it's measuring 2.131. Okay, now I'm going to measure it up here. It's 2.4 up here. That's a significant amount. So the problem with the teeter-totter is if it's measuring it that high up off the surface of the, of the record, you're going to get an incorrect rating. It's going to be a little high. So if you set it for two grams there, when you get to the surface, it's going to be different. It's going to be lower. The lower you, you measure it, the, the, you know, the higher you measure it, the more the arm's going to be wanting to get down to, the, to, to level. So it's not that accurate. Again, if you spend $30 on a, car on a cartridge, you know, then it's fine. If you've spent a lot of money on a cartridge, you want to get a good, a good gauge. This gauge is a, little bit, is a little bit tall. It's actually a little inaccurate. You have to kind of increase the stylus, decrease the stylus pressure, increase the stylus pressure a little bit when you get to the surface of the record after you measure it using that. See, I'm both methlexic and, and spatially challenged, and I can do this. So if I can do this, anybody can do this as long as your hands aren't shaking. I was wondering what's the... Uh safest way to clean the cartridge needle? What, the uh, stylus? The stylus. Okay, so there are, different, there are different ways of doing that. So there's, there's the little stiff brush, which is good. You, you know, liquids are great. I use liquids, but that's not going to be enough over time, eventually, because there's a lot of heat generated inside, you know, at the, at the tip. And dirt is going to adhere to it and, and literally stick and, and harden. And so even if you, the liquid will loosen it, but you've got to use one of those stiff brushes to remove it. There's also a couple of mounds of goo that they have that, the, the one 
dust, whatever that's called, a that green little thing. Zero, yeah, I like that a lot too, but you gotta really be careful with that because if the platter rotates, it will take out your stylus. Well, I use all of them, and, and even after using all of them and trying to be good about it, I'll take the digital microscope and do a close-up and it's horrendous. Whatever happened to that Lyra Atlas that was on your website that had all the crystals? That was mine. It? What happened to it? I cleaned it and I cleaned it and I, you know. It worked? Yeah, it's, and I, I still use it and it's, it's a great cartridge, but you know, I thought I was cleaning it pretty good, but I wasn't. That's another good reason to have a digital microscope, so you can check it every so often. And the stylus will last longer when it's clean. When it gets dirty, uh, and your records will last longer too, because when it gets really dirty and, and it hardens up into a different shape than it's supposed to be, it's just gonna cut through the grooves. Any other questions? Just one last one. How do you know when the cartridge is, its life is done? Is there a practical way short of it? No. Well, the stylus will wear out over time. You should, you should get at least 2,500 hours out of it. If, if the records are clean and the stylus is clean, and you can go down from there if, if you don't take care of your records and clean your stylus. 2,500 hours is, is, is a pretty good amount. I mean, I don't sit there with a, with a stopwatch and you know, time it, but at some point you, you'll start hearing, if, if, it, if it wears evenly, it's kind of insidious because you're not gonna hear distortion, but you will lose detail. Things, will round, things that are supposed to be angular will become round and the tracing in the, in the grooves will not be as, as full. It won't get all the way into the grooves. It'll kind of miss things. So things will start sounding not kind of as good as it should. I say if you don't hear it, you don't miss it, don't worry about it. But, uh, and, and also over time, the, um, the suspension's gonna harden up, especially if you live in a high ozone area. It's like what happens to your windshield wipers. It'll harden up over time. But you, you should be able to get four or five years, unless you play records incessantly every minute, or you fall asleep with the stylus and we all have done that, I'm sure. Any, any other? I, I invested on the phosgometer. Uh, phosgometer? Yeah. yeah. So how, you mentioned earlier that it's just an approximation. Yeah, it gets how, close. How close is that? Because, you know, the, the, uh, it's, uh, it's that close. <laughs> I can't, I, you know, I can't say, I don't remember. I know that I, I said it with that and then I, I put. did use the ultimate test LPI. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Better than noth it's better than nothing. Um, a digital oscilloscope is better, but it's a lot more work to do it and to figure out how to use it. So I can't really say the phosgometer is okay. You know, if you want to start with that and then play a little bit and then uh, listen, no, don't do that. That's just not worth it. Is there an order of adjustment? I did it in the order I think you should do it. Overhang, zenith angle, anti-skating, VTA, azimuth. I've got, I've got a question about tone arm length. It seems to be, you know, nine inch tone arm has become popular than 12 inch. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what are the pros and cons of, of Okay, there are trade-offs, you know, all this is a trade, there's trade-offs involved in all of this. So the longer the arm, the less the offset angle. So the less the skating. So anti-skating is less of an issue. You have to play less anti-skating. So that's one positive. The longer the tone arm, the lower the tracking distortion is, but, because it's hanging out further, the, the more, if, the, if there's any error created in your setup, it's magnified. So your, your setup has to be absolutely perfect to get the benefit of a longer tone arm in terms of distortion. So there are all these, and then there's a the moment of inertia. The longer the arm, the more lumbering it's gonna be. And the longer the arm, the more you're dealing with a, a lack of stiffness in the arm tube. So all things being equal, I think a nine inch tone arm properly set up is fine. That's, that's what my arm is, and it's pretty darn good. Um, the, the new VPI 12-inch arm is amazingly good. That epoxy uh, printed arm, it, it eliminates all the issues of, of rigidity of a longer arm. So it's a little unwieldy. If you ever tried to play with that arm, it's a little unwieldy, and, and it's, uh, the moment of inertia gets to be a little bit, but it sounds fantastic. So. Um, and along those lines, what about compliance um, and, you know, Weight and Ma massive all of that. compliance. Like, I, I this, mean, this whole mass, this, this whole thing is a is a mass, light, is a, is a spring it's weight heavy system. And then it's yeah, so you know, a heavy weight on a on a on a loose spring is going to be bouncing a lot, big big excursions, and a stiff spring and a light weight is going to be at a high frequency. So there, there's an ideal range of uh, compliance versus mass. And fortunately, there's there's a graph. I've got it on my DVD, and I'm sure you can find it online. That shows you you find the effective mass of the arm, most arms will tell you what the effective mass. You add the mass of the cartridge and then you have a mass. 
and then you find the compliance of the cartridge from the manufacturer, and you look at the other axis on the graph, and it'll, you want between 8 and 12 hertz to be the resonant frequency of the system. And the Hi-Fi News test record does have a very good track there, and it'll show you where the resonant frequency is. And if it falls between 8 and 12, you're good. If you play that test track and the arm never starts to bounce around, you got a big problem because it means your resonant frequency is either well below the test record or well above it, and that's not a good thing. And most, okay, linear tracking arms. So, you know, this is one of these cans of worms that gets opened up because if the manufacturer, are we almost done? Yeah. Okay, I'll just answer that. People like different things. It really, I, I once owned a linear tracking, an eminent technology two arm, and I thought I'm tracking linearly. Most of those arms are not really tracking. What they're doing is they're crabbing their way across the record. They're actually creating mini arcs, mini distortion arcs all the way across the record, or they're moving in that direction. Or I mean, there's all kinds of issues involved with all, all these technologies have issues. And in the long run, I finally come to the conclusion that a properly set up pivoted arm is the best way to go. And most of the linear, even, even the ones that use um, air pressure, most of those air pressure uh, devices, the problem is, if you ever blow up a balloon and let go of a balloon, it, go, it starts going like that. Unless you use a, a properly groove compensated air bearing, which are very expensive, and a Rockport uses those. And what that does is there's high pressure where the, where the bearing has is, is got no friction. By the time it gets to the annular gap where the air has to get out, it's regulated the pressure so it's very low at the output, and that's perfect, and that's a very expensive bearing. Most of the guys that are making these arms don't use that kind of a bearing, so the air is at very high pressure when it gets to the gap, and what's happening at the gap is and all that resonating gets picked up by the arm, and that's why a lot of those air bearing arms sound very bright, because the arm is actually shaking it. You don't see it, but it's at a very high frequency. So either you don't see the arm crabbing across the record when it's on the roller type things, or you don't see the arm shaking at a very high frequency speed when it's got an improperly designed air bearing. You know, so what are, you, what are you benefiting? You're getting a maybe approximate little bit less distortion maybe, but you're getting all these other problems. Plus you have a pump that makes noise. I don't. But again, people like that. Whatever it is you like, the great part about this hobby is whatever it is you like, you go through these rooms, you'll hear every kind of speaker, every kind of sound, and you know, I know guys that write for my magazine who don't like anything above 8,000 hertz, they, they have a problem with that, because I've been to their houses, they like that warm, soft sound, and that's fine, whatever you like. Any other, I think we're done, we're done. So thank you very much for coming, I hope this was useful for you. Thank you.